I will say this about OBJ. I think OBJ is a nice addition, but I am firmly in the camp that OBJ, as as good as he can be, he is he has not been the same player. He has not made an all pro team, a Pro Bowl team, since he was with the Giants. That was a long time ago. He didn't even play last season. So I think he is certainly an upgrade, absolutely, over what the Ravens did last season. But certainly, when you say, oh, they have OBJ, they have OBJ, yes, and he was very good for the Rams, got his ring before getting injured in that game. But he's not the OBJ that we saw with the Giants. He is a very good receiver. He's not the guy that comes with the name. No, he's like your home run hitter. He is a big name. He's going to demand defensive attention. And every once again, he will flash signs of his former brilliance because isn't that what we saw with the Rams? Like he can yeah. still be uh, extremely a top end talent. So I think it's there, but I don't think he's going to be like the number one everyday uh, yeah. receiver who is putting up the bulk yardage. I think that's still probably going to be Mark Andrews. Wasn't Mark Andrews the guy last year for the Ravens, even though he is a tight end and somebody who was great in the props market just about every week because he got the targets. I had 113 targets last year, 847 yards, mm -hmm. uh, averaging 11.6 yards per catch. Uh, so I think he's probably going to be the guy again. I feel like his rapport with Lamar Jackson is pretty solid. And it didn't even seem to matter who was playing quarterback for Mark Andrews. So that is a good anchor uh, to a receiving core that added a lot of new talent. There is some kind of situation brewing with J.K. Dobbins and the Ravens. Can you enlighten us on maybe some details on what's going on with J.K. Dobbins and the pup list? Well, apparently he's holding in, which is one of the new terms when it comes to the National Football League, where you oh. report to camp, but you don't participate. Now, the official word from the Ravens is that he has a lower body or soft tissue injury, didn't uh, participate in OTAs, was not part of mandatory minicamp, and obviously so far we're three weeks in now to training camp. You know, he's not on the field. He had expressed in an interview with Mark Viviano here in WJZ that the contract situation might be bothering him to some level. He's in the last year of his rookie deal. He was a second-round pick out of Ohio State. I mean, this is a guy that missed an entire season in 2021 because of a knee injury. Last year, played half the games because he was still lingering effects, had to get cleaned up, was playing very well, by the way, down the stretch. But I don't, I don't know who his agent is, full disclosure. I don't know what kind of advice he's getting. It's not very good. I don't know if, know if they're reading the room. I mean, Dalvin Cook and Zeke Elliott, who have much greater track records than J.K. Dobbins does, are right now unemployed as mm -hmm. we're less than a month away from the start of the NFL season. And this guy's trying to strong arm the Ravens and giving him a long-term contract. By the way, they have Patrick Queen on the defensive side of the ball, who's in the same situation, was a first-round pick, whose option they declined. So they still have other players that they have to take care of. But J.K. Dobbins is an outstanding player, but I just don't get where he thinks he has leverage right now. And they brought in Melvin Gordon a couple of weeks ago. Gus Edwards is another year removed from the injury he suffered. Same week Dobbins got hurt, ironically enough. They re-signed Justice Hill to a two-year deal. So they do have options. He's their best running back. I get that, but I don't think he's doing himself any favors right now. So when you look at this team, you talk about Lamar Jackson running quarterback, and of course he is the story after signing that deal in the offseason. How much will he be assisted this season by Todd Monk in running that offense? I think Monk has been a, a very, very big influence on Lamar Jackson so far this yeah. year, and he's actually given him more responsibility. Took away the wristband uh, at least a couple of weeks ago because uh, Greg Roman kind of micromanaged to the point where it became frustrating to a lot of people. And, look, Greg Roman helped Lamar Jackson win a Most Valuable Player Award back yeah. in 2019, but it seemed as though offense got a little stale and, as you know, air quotes, everybody – kind of figured him out, a lot of pre-snap penalties, always up against it when it came to the play clock. So Munkin's going to give Lamar more freedom. They're going to get the plays in quicker, more freedom to improvise and adapt at the line of scrimmage as opposed to after the snap, taking off and running. Because I think in the big picture, they'd like him to run less and incorporate the running backs a little bit more 
into the passing game. They're going to take their shots down the field. I think Lamar Jackson, health permitting, of course, is primed for a pretty big year. They had a really bad day two days in a row, Friday and Saturday last week in that camp. Or the Saturday, I think all the quarterbacks can buy for nine picks. But, you know, they bounced back a little bit yesterday. One concern for them offensively, not only with Dobbins, but Rashad Bateman hasn't practiced yet, who was their first-round pick out of Minnesota a couple of years ago. He had the Liz Frank injury that he's still recovering from. Zay Flowers has looked great. Odell Beckham Jr. has looked like Odell Beckham. Nelson Aguilar has been a nice surprise for them at wide receiver in camp. Andrew's a premier tight end, so they still have some weapons for Lamar, but Dobbins and Bateman are two pretty integral ones, and they're not there right now. Well, they're there, but they're not. As an Orioles guy yourself, this has been an awesome story to follow. And as you know, if you live in the DMV, there are a lot of longtime Orioles fans in this area who've been waiting for a season like this. There's so much fun going on covering Baltimore. Why in the world will they pull something like this? It just seems like the biggest wet blanket ever. Yeah, I good morning, Jenks and Chelsea. Jenks, the uh the sports world, the baseball world got a look at the Angelos family last night and uh their yep. their ownership, you know. It and to Chelsea's point, you know, and to what you were saying as well, Jenks, it just it's even more amazing that Baltimore has had the season that they're having because usually when ownership is that bad, it, it's tough to have a team this good, but the Orioles have managed to have a great season. And to me, like that's the most dis- disappointing part of all of this. The Orioles are having such a good year. The last thing that you want is a distraction like this on the outside, especially when you're getting ready to play a season or a series, excuse me, against yeah. the defending champion Houston Astros. Uh, you know, people were so excited for this three-game series coming up. Orioles have the best record in the American League. You have the defending champs coming into your house. Like, this was going to be a big-time series, really mm-hmm. to see how, how close the Orioles are to the Astros, you know, how close the gap is. Because the Orioles are right there. I mean, they, they definitely can win the World Series. Houston definitely can, obviously, as well. And, uh, you know, uh, people were really looking forward to this series. And then for this Kevin Brown situation to come out, you know, it was weird, too, because I watch the Orioles just about every night, and Kevin Brown mm-hmm. hasn't been calling games for the last, like, week, week and a half. And then about a couple days ago on Twitter, it really started to pick up some steam. Like, why isn't Kevin Brown calling some of these games against the Blue yeah. Jays and the Yankees? Like, what's going on here? And then the story drops yesterday, and you find out the reason why, and it's just it, it's mind-blowing, quite, quite frankly, because like you said, the guy simply did nothing wrong. If anything, he highlighted the importance of that Tampa Bay series because at the time, it was a battle for first place in the AL East, and it just showed how far the Orioles have come, like you guys have mentioned. So it just, it sucks, man. Angelos is, they just, they're such a bad owner, and the team is is clicking. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm sure every other Orioles fan will tell you as well, we're terrified that this young core of talent that they have with Adley and Gunner and Grayson Rodriguez and Jackson Holiday coming up, he's going to find a way to screw it up. And he's probably going to be cheap, and he's probably not going to pay him. If you're an owner, this is what you want, right? Mike Elias, the front office, they did all the hard stuff. They got a winning baseball team on the field. It's your job as an owner now to keep it all together, keep these guys happy and pay them. And then you pull stuff like this, and you put a dark cloud over the organization, and you give them a distraction that – by no means should you have done, and it's just, it's awful. So hopefully, you know, the Orioles can kind of continue to play great baseball despite this, but it's just an unnecessary distraction. And also, where do you draw the line? Like, is he not supposed to mention losses from here on out? That would be the most confounding part of this, is that, like, how do you not repeat this quote-unquote mistake? Like, are you like, well, the Orioles, they've won all of their games. Not a single struggle. They're going to win every single game this year. So I don't know where you draw the line if you're the announcer. It feels like a very tough job. Uh, it looks like the Titans are going to let assistant an assistant uh, run, call the shots in a preseason game. So he's going to have Terrell Williams handle the head coaching duties in the preseason opener against the Chicago Bears. This just goes to my point of saying, Do not bet on preseason football games. 
literally nobody cares about the outcome. That is my one takeaway from this is that Mike Vrabel's yeah. like, eh, it's the preseason. I don't even care. So um, what do you make of this? Is this registering for you uh, as something that we need to pay attention to? Or is it just another example of, like, nobody cares about the preseason? I, you know what I think this is? And maybe I'm stretching a little bit. Maybe I've spent too much time thinking about this. But I think this is a chance for a longtime black coach in the NFL to show what he can do as a head coach. Right here in D.C., we had Eric Bieniemy who is the offensive coordinator for the Commanders, as we know. And for years and years and years, what did we hear? He worked with Andy Reid, and we thought, okay, he's going to be a guy who eventually gets a head coaching job. That never happened. It still hasn't happened. At one point, it will. So you're talking about a guy in Terrell Williams who has 26 years of coaching experience. 26 years. So I think this is Mike Vrabel, who's going to be on the sidelines saying, you know what? Why don't you show what you can do as a head coach? Let's give you some experience here, and maybe that helps you down the line if you want to become a head coach. I think that's what it means. Maybe I'm extrapolating too much out of this, but I feel like it's a good way to give this guy some shine. Let him show what he can do. Yeah, this is another reason why so many people like Mike Vrabel.